Welcome to Unit 5, Classical Greece. This unit will be looking at the various city-states that make up the Aegean Peninsula from around 2000 to 250 BC. From Athens to Sparta and Carthage to Troy, this region and the civilizations within it brought about a unique perspective from the other cultures that we've already looked at. Here we have a perspective of the civilizations that would thrive with little help from the rivers or other resources around them that really didn't exist, but instead they had to use what little resource they did have in order to survive. As usual, please make sure that we get rid of all the distractions and we put those things away so that we can focus on being successful and getting in the information we need from this lecture. As usual, at the end of this lecture, if there's something you need some help with, please feel free to let me know and we'll get that taken care of for you right away. And with that, let's begin. So first, let's get some of our terms. As usual, we have five terms, so here's the first one. City-state, an area the size of a city, but its own country. We've seen this one before, and again, the best way to describe it is thinking of a city like Milwaukee but it being its own country, separate from West Dallas, Wauwatosa, or even the bigger state of Wisconsin, Milwaukee being its own country. That's what a city-state is. It's not uncommon from the time period back then to have all these different city-states in the same geographical region, but have completely different governments or completely different cultures or ways of doing things. Even though they might have been neighbors, they were separate governments, separate cities, or in this case we call them city-states. Our second term is the trireme. It's given to a name of a particular kind of boat. This combination of sail and row was used both to transport people as well as a weapon system on the high seas. Stay tuned for a more descriptive discussion on this later as we'll get into a little bit more detail on how this ship was designed and its purposes, especially when we talk about some of the other battles. I believe it's in Lecture 3 we'll talk about that. Our third term is Homer. No, not Homer, Sis Homer Simpson, <laughs> but Homer the Poet. He was an author of the time period of the Trojan War, and it is a lot of his epic stories that we get a lot of information about the Greek gods, as well as what it was like to live during the time period of the ancient Greece, Greeks. His two books, or as they're called technically as epics, were the Iliad and the Odyssey. The Iliad spoke primarily of the Trojan War, including Achilles and the battles going on with that. And the Odyssey, the other book, was about a guy by the name of Odysseus and his travels home from the Trojan War. We'll talk a little bit briefly about that later as well. The Mediterranean Sea, of course, is the largest salt body of water in the world. The sea was a major resource for the Greeks, not for drinking, but for its other resources and other things that it was able to provide. As we can see here from the map, the Mediterranean Sea is a huge and vast body of water just south of Europe uh, and north of Africa, kind of splitting the two apart. We'll talk more about the importance of the Mediterranean Sea throughout this unit. The Aegean Sea was also is also part technically of the Mediterranean Sea. It's one little offspurt of it. It was also kind of a lifeline to the Greeks back then. As you can see, the Aegean Sea is the area between Greece and present-day Turkey. That ta that was a major trade route as well as used for many battles during the ancient times we're going to discuss. So keep that in mind as we go forward, especially again when we talk about the Battle of Marathon uh, in our next lecture. It'll come up again there as well. So let's get started with setting our stage and into our actual discussions here. Looking at the geography of the ancient Greeks, it certainly was considerably different than that of the previous cultures that we've studied. When we look at the Greek civilization, 
we need to make sure that we identify it as a variety of cultures all living within one geographic area. A lot of different cultures all around the same location. A lot of them had similar cultures or similar characteristics, but each one had its own little twist to it that made it unique from some of the others. Four of these civilizations we're going to take a look at today include the Minoans, the Messenians, the Phoenicians, and the Dorians. First, let's take a look exactly about the area of where Greece is and its location and how that influences or how it could influence the people around it. From this map, if we zoom in into the south central part um, of Europe, you'll see where Greece is. Greece today is about 192,000 square miles, which is a little bit bigger than the state of California. So that kind of gives you an idea of how much space or what Greece looks like today. Back then, Greece was a lot different. We'll talk about that shortly. Something to be aware of, though, is that when we do talk about ancient Greece, we need to remember that we are referring to the geographic area of Greece and not the country of Greece. Back in the day, Greece was not one country, as we see it today, as I just mentioned. It was a group of independent city-states, each one separate and autonomous from the other. Sometimes they would have to work together to survive. Sometimes they'd go to war with one another for different reasons. But the important thing to realize is when we use the word Greece, we're referring to the region of Greece, all the different city-states that make it up or make up that region. We'll talk more specifically about the city-states as necessary, and we'll identify them separately uh, when we need to. So just make sure we have that clarifying part in there when we use these terms. The other thing to look at about ancient Greece is that it's not just a large body of land, but it's also made up of a lot of islands all throughout the Aegean and northern Mediterranean Sea, as we see here. From Rhodes to Crete, even as far as what present-day Israel, which is off the map, we consider part of ancient Greece, because all of these different city-states all traded together and worked together and even sometimes went to war with one another. So that's why we use this vast area when we use the word Greece because all these people were relying upon each other or going to war with one another uh, at some time or another and it just makes sense to kind of group them all into one big area that we call Greece. So Geography shapes Greek's life. So more things to know about the ancient Greece is that it's mostly consisted, or mostly consisted of mountainous peninsula that jutted out into the Mediterranean Sea. Besides the peninsula that makes up most of the region, there are over 2,000 islands within the Aegean and the Ionian Seas, which is on both sides of the Greek mainland. Now, Greece's water supply isn't like that of other civilizations we've looked at. The sea was to Greece as what the rivers were to Egypt and Mesopotamia. Sometimes it's even said that the Greeks don't live on land, but they live around the sea. This just characterizes and describes on how important the sea was to Greek life. Because of their reliance on the sea, the Greeks became masters at shipbuilding, mostly due to their need for trade. However, these skills at shipbuilding also proved to be valuable when it came to some of their more interesting sea battles. And again, we'll discuss those later on in the lecture as well as future uh, discussions throughout the unit. Hey look, it's another map. At this point, we need to make sure that we look at the physical features of Greece. Looking at the mainland and the islands, you can see a lot of brown. That brown represents some high mountains and a lot of rock. There isn't a lot of flat land here. Remember, it's the flat land that allows people to have agriculture and farms. Most agriculture was done on small plots of land on either side of the city walls or just outside. They did not have a lot of room for farming. 
Note that there are some rivers to the north and central parts of the mainland Greece. However, they really did not come down to the rest of the peninsula. This did provide them with a limited source of water, but because of the flow of the rivers and the small amount of water that was available, it provided very little water for irrigation and drinking. Not enough water for transportation of goods to and from uh, the area on the peninsula. When looking at the physical features of Greece, and most of the islands, you might find yourself asking, why the heck would anybody want to live in an area with this kind of a harsh environment? Well, if you check out the natural resources that Greek had to offer, there really wasn't much of anything. Greece lacked natural resources. There was a lack of farmland, timber, and, ancient, and precious metals. Not a whole lot of things working in their favor as to why people would want to live here uh, and make this their home. As mentioned before, Greece had a lot of rock and mountain. About three-fourths of, of the region, actually, of ancient Greece was rugged mountains or rocks. So there wasn't a lot of room for them to be planting stuff, building large cities and civilizations. These mountains ended up dividing Greece into different territories that helped to shape Greece, Greek's political life. It separated the different city-states and allowed them the autonomy from one another. It's easier to have separate countries or separate city-states in this case if you can't see the other city on the other side. Uh, an example would be Milwaukee and West Dallas. They're very similar to one another because you can literally cross the street and then you're in a different city even though it might not feel that way. Well, back then it was a lot different. You can't just cross the street. You actually have to walk miles before you can get to another flat area of land where people had their farms and their other city-states from, uh, from a different group of people. It wasn't like they were just next door. They were close, but not that close. And those different uh, cities were independent from one another. The mountains made travel difficult because of the uneven terrain. There were trade routes between the different locations around Greece, but the inconsistent terrain didn't make it easy. All that rock and uneven terrain made large-scale irrigation virtually impossible, as we mentioned earlier, and the land was not able to sustain large populations because of the lack of farmland. Farms produce food, and if there are small farms, there will be small populations. That's just how it is, and they couldn't get out of that rut of the amount of land that they didn't have for the populations they couldn't support. However, with all these bad things, there was a good thing about Greece. It was a very beautiful place to live when you're looking at the climate. The temperature consist, or pretty much varied between 48 degrees and 80 degrees Fahrenheit all year round. Never snowed, rains occasionally, very temperate, very comfortable all year round. Today, Greece is one of the more popular tourist attractions year-round in the world. People go to Greece all over the all year-round, making them a very uh, popular for for tourism. So, as we talked about earlier, we got about four cultures we got to talk about. The first of these cultures we're going to talk about are the Minoans. And if you look here at the map on the arrow, you can see where the Minoans actually started from, which was the small island of Crete. For those of you that are interested, uh, especially those that are interested in Greek mythology, there is a legend of King Minos who lived there and had the power to turn anything into gold with the touch of his hand. It's also said that it's home to the ancient Greek monster, the Minotaur. Despite the fact that they were located on an island, they did do a lot of trade with other Greek civilizations at the same time as the Minoans, um, which created this whole ability 
for these groups of people to intermingle and create a type of cultural diffusion. It was the Minoans that provided a new standard for Greek architecture, burial customs, and religious rituals. The Messenians, which was another group of people we'll talk about shortly, even adapted their writing systems, politics, art to that of the Minoans. Uh, they elected so much and it agreed with their culture and personalities that the two kind of meshed and worked together. We also know that because of the extremely comfortable weather on the island, the people were very outdoorsy and athletic. They would hold their own gaming competitions amongst the men, and it was probably a precursor of the original Greek Olympics, which is what we celebrate every four years when we have our Olympics throughout the world uh, in modern times. The second civilization we need to know about are the Phoenicians. Being more than 800 miles away by boat from the Greek mainland, Phoenicia had an extremely significant role to play in Greek life. And as you can see from the map, they are a long way away, but still part of this Greek civilization that we want to make you uh, familiar with. Today, we have a lot to thank the Phoenicians for. The fact that you're listening and reading this lecture uh, is part because of the Phoenicians and what they gave the world. And what did they give us? Well, they gave us the phonetic alphabet. Simply put, the phonetic alphabet is when we put sounds to symbols. And when you combine those symbols and sounds together, they make words. These symbols and letters are what we call the alphabet. Interesting fact about the alphabet, the actual word itself, actually. It's a combination of the first two letters of the Greek alphabet. A, alpha, and B for bet, alphabet. So now you know where the word comes from if you ever are interested in giving some trivia. The other major significance of the Phoenicians was the fact that they were excellent ship shipbuilders. Specifically, they were great at building merchant ships for trade. These boats became the standard as far as how trans to transport goods across the Mediterranean Sea. And with the trading of goods also comes the trading of ideas. This whole idea of cultural diffusion, which we've talked about before, which is the mingling of different cultures together to create sometimes a new culture or a hybrid culture. Learning more about another culture by meeting other cultures. That's cultural diffusion. Here we can see the translations between the Phoenician language and to that of the Egyptians, Semitic, and Latin. If you look closely, you might see some similarities between them, especially on the Latin side or the right side. Some similar characteristics or symbols um, that make up their alphabet as well as ours today. Considered to be the first Greek, our third culture are the Messenians. As you can see from the map, they encompassed the majority of present-day Greece. The best, as best as historians can tell, the Messenians were around, or they were in Greece around 650 to 1200 BC. Because their civilization is spread across such a large number of islands as well as the mainland, they relied upon sea transportation for trade. So the Messenians needed the sea to trade and to travel. It was their lifeline because without all that traveling and trade, uh, they would not be able to influence those around them. And because of this, they would be influencing everybody that they traded with. On these travels, it allowed the Messenians to learn about different religions, uh, practices of politics, as well as different literature from the region. One of the more interesting events uh, of the time of the Messenians is the Trojan War, which you might have heard of. Delivery! <laughs> 
<laughs> Looking good, Diomedes. Menelaus, my man! My man. Are you ready to get on the field, Shermanus? Sure thing, Mr. Agamemnon. Soldiers hiding inside a big wooden horse in order to get into an enemy city. I'm sure you've heard of that one. We're going to talk about this again. And the fourth and final culture um, are the Dorians. We don't know a lot about these people. What we do know is they took over after the Messenians, but they didn't keep any written records of what was going on during their time period um, that they ruled over or lived in Greece. So we really don't know a lot about them. This time period traditionally or sometimes is known as the Dark Period or the Dark Ages of Greek history, only because we don't know a lot about the Dorians other than they existed. So, now that we got the cultures out of the way, or the four specific cultures, let's put them all together and see how they meshed and became one Greek culture. Because of the warm climate, Greeks enjoyed and participated in outdoorsy type of activities. And as we saw earlier, it was the terrain that made the system of city-states thrive. It was these city-states that operated like independent countries. And because of all of these different independent countries and these different city-states, they were able to separate from one another and be independent from one another, but not an empire. An empire is where one civilization takes over another civilization and rules them. That's not what happened here. Okay, These were independent cities on their own, away from one another, not an empire. We'll be talking more about empires later on when we get to talking about Alexander the Great near the end of the unit. Even though the different city-states were similar in many ways, uh, they did, however, differ in their politics and military from one another. If you visited ancient Athens, for example, and compared it to ancient Sparta, the people looked the same, but their way of life was drastically different. So they might have come from the same area, they might only have been a few miles apart from one another, their civilizations, or their culture rather, were drastically different. They might have shared some things, but a lot of things were different as well. So keep that in mind as we talk about some of these civilizations and cultures. All these cities did exist within the Greek region, and as we mentioned, were independent from one another. Can you see a theme here? We're kind of pushing the fact that they were separate from one another. From time to time, uh, as we'll learn, they did rely upon each other to survive through trade or through joining their military forces together to overcome a common enemy. But, as we mentioned also, sometimes these city-states would also go to war with one another. So, good days and bad days with these city-states. And of course, all cultures have their stories and storytellers. As we mentioned before, the Greeks had their epics. Epics simply is defined as poems that celebrate heroic deeds with very interesting characters. One of these epics was written by a blind storyteller by the name of Homer, who we briefly talked about earlier. And no, we're not talking about Homer Simpson. We're talking about this Homer here. He wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey. His poems, which are more like books actually, are known throughout the world as being a great example of understanding ancient Greek culture and society. His two books, The Iliad and the Odyssey, both told stories of romance, war, struggles of life, uh, depression, a lot of things that we kind of can understand today, but was also going on back in the 1500s BC or the time of the Trojan War and shortly thereafter. Much we know about Greek God and Greek history comes from these two books. Um, you can still get them at the library. You can actually download them for free off the internet if you're interested. 
A little bit ago, we talked about the Phoenician trade ships. Well, these ships um, that were used for battle were not so much for trade, obviously, but these were trireme ships. Um, sturdy ships with battering rams used to destroy the enemy. What made them unique was the fact that they had this battering ram in the front that was usually tipped with some sort of copper or very hard wood in order to ram the enemy's boat. Because the battering ram was so low on the boat, if you could puncture your enemy's boat, it would cause them to sink. The fact that they had a lot of oarsmen and could use the power of the wind as well allowed them to use this boat all throughout the region regardless of the wind, regardless of the currents, they could get around during the battles. You'll see these ships used um, all throughout Greek naval battles. Uh, some of them are quite fun and uh, interesting when you're reading about thousands of these trireme ships all being used in one battle. Uh, it's quite uh, interesting if you uh, are interested in, in getting to read more about that. Another thing to look at uh, from the past, and more interestingly is how this past influences us today, is the architecture. Okay, Yeah, we hear about all these old guys, these old ships, all these old things going on thousands of years ago, but what does it have to do with us today? Well, let's take a look at a few things. This building here is known as the Parthenon. Originally, it was built as a temple to the goddess Athena, and it sits on top of a hill known as the Athenian Acropolis in Athens. Now, if you look closer, we have another building. This is the Milwaukee County Courthouse downtown. You see some similarities. You've got the pillars that go up and down. You've got the square features, the, the massive amount of stone put into this. If you look at the top right above where the pillars are, there's engravings just like they had in Greece. A lot of similarities from something that we see today, almost every day, to something that existed 3,000 years ago. And we can even continue on if you look just at the U.S. Supreme Court building in Washington, D.C. Heck, they even made a mock Parthenon in the city of Memphis, Tennessee. Ultimately, it would be the Greeks, however, that we have to thank for how we as Americans live today. The Greeks would come up with the idea of democracy, the creating of new ideas with using philosophies and politics, as well as strategies on warfare and their unique architectural abilities. It was also the Greeks who dared take on the world's superpower at the time, the Persians, and won, similar to World War I, when the U.S. wasn't even a superpower, but after World War I, everybody took the United States seriously. Kind of the same thing here going on with the Greeks and the Persians. Thanks to Alexander the Great, his successes in battle would blend Greek, Persian, and Egyptian cultures together as he conquered northern Egypt and much of the western and southern countries of Asia. We'll talk more about this later on in our fourth lecture, specifically on Alexander the Great. Um, and his merging of these cultures, which we now know as the Hellenistic period. And with that, I'm done. This is our first lecture for this unit. I hope you enjoyed it. Again, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to let me know. This is one of the more fun units that I enjoy teaching. Um, so with that, keep going, and I look forward to seeing you guys in class. Have a great day.